name is Matthew Poyagi and I work for Pearson View uh, as Vice President for Europe, Middle East and Africa. Um, View is the professional assessment division of the Pearson, of the Pearson Group. And we deliver something like 16 million exams each year for our clients around the world. And these are for people either entering their professions for admissions to medical or dental school, for licenses to practice, and also to help governments set benchmarks of learning to improve skills standards across various industries. Now, throughout my career, I've been a passionate advocate for lifelong learning. So to help queue up the panel session that's coming up just shortly, for just 10 minutes, I'd like you to be open to thinking completely differently. And I'll use the marshmallow to help set the scene. And you may be familiar with the marshmallow test by Stanford University some years ago, where kids were offered a choice between one marshmallow as an immediate reward or two marshmallows if they could just wait for a short period of time. And the analogy here that it's about the long term versus the short and technology and the impact on how we live and work and learn isn't a quick fix for tomorrow only. We are not going back. We have to be in this for the long term. Now, one well-known businessman in the UK said, you have to kill your business. You have to embrace digital transformation and do business totally differently. We look at startups like Uber and Airbnb, and they are disrupting every industry and every job function. And education and learning has lagged behind other industries in moving to a digitally driven outcomes focused model. Plus education is a people intensive sector, which suggests the opportunity for disruption is very strong. And with the onset of the pandemic, of course, education has had no choice but to pick up pace and change. And so people are learning differently. And really it's not a moment too soon as there is a strain on the market globally and a shortage for millions of skilled workers. So technology has changed how we digest news, how we communicate and share information, even how we look to find new business and, and do business online. And it's also introduced a new model for learning because kids today learn differently they are immersed in the experience of doing. And some say that kids can't focus, but of course they can focus, just not on the way that we try and interact with them. You know, if you've seen how some of these kids concentrate when they play Fortnite or FIFA. And technology by itself is not the disruptor, but not being customer and learner centric is the biggest threat that we face today. The work environment is also changing. If 1.3 billion people were working virtually before the pandemic, just think how many more that is today with so many of us working from home. And we haven't even begun the trend that will go from work from home to work from anywhere that will give rise to the digital nomad. Companies will have to accept this change in future in order to attract and keep the best talent. But equally, people will have to take responsibility for their skills and staying up to date. So the future of work will include no CVs, no performance reviews, everything mobile, artificial intelligence and digital work assistance. People are really comfortable now living public lives. They communicate and they collaborate online. And these behaviours are cascading to companies driving us to make changes to accommodate these. Technologies such as big data, the cloud, AI, robotics, automation, are changing how we work and live, and they're forcing us to rethink the jobs that humans should be doing. The important thing about the next generation of workers isn't the fact that they have these new approaches or values of styles of work, but that there are so many of them they are the largest generation to ever enter the workforce. Now they really get technology, but they will also wait until they find a company that they really want to work for. In other words, we as organizations need to shift from assuming that people need to work for us and they need a job to one where people want to work for us and that they choose 
to work for us because they like what we stand for. And for the last two, um, it, it matters less now where we are, as long as we are essentially connected to the business and online. And in a world where work has no boundaries, language and currency and physical location matter less and less. Knowledge workers do not spend their careers with one company. They change jobs frequently, and with future generations, the likelihood is this will increase. So it's about lifetime employability, not lifetime employment. Work is less permanent, and more flexible. Now, some of us have been watching the election since the early hours. And if you look at the US, 20% of American workers are already contingent rather than permanent. That's more than 30 million people. Most of Uber's growth has come from drivers who use their own cars and 75% of them have other jobs. So what then happens when a job for life becomes a job for a day? At Pearson, we ran a global survey with 11,000 learners. And from their feedback, we're beginning to see disruption in the learning space. University was historically the place to go to get prepared for the professional workforce. But young people are now questioning the model's ability to deliver on that need. The cost, the time frame, and the speed of change don't fit. People are looking for ways to get skills, to find jobs quickly, but without necessarily going deeply into debt. And the traditional model of learning was, it was invented when education would get you your first and your last job. But in our dynamic society, people have lots of careers and what we learn expires really quickly. So the internet is the new classroom. We have to take learning out to the students. So education will look different. School will escape the classroom. The internet has no walls and students may attend schools in different countries. Subjects could cross pollinate. Today, departments are sorted by subject with almost no overlap, but the internet is multidisciplinary by nature. So those divisions could fade and students could become producers. That sit back and listen style of education has to go. Students will learn by doing and creating and building things. Every student pretty much now has a smartphone in their pocket with an HD camera and the ability to connect with anybody on the planet. <clears throat> so how about assessment? Tests, first of all, have to be current. Learning systems have to be irresistibly engaging for students and teachers. They have to be easy to use and steeped in real life problem solving. <clears throat> If they're not, students will switch off, especially with their ever decreasing attention spans and social media's effect of focusing only on that short term memory. They have to relate directly to what an individual does in the workplace. So if an accounting student works on spreadsheets and charts, the test has to include those same activities. But it helps learners demonstrate competence in real life skills and it supports the shift from assessing whether candidates know something to measuring their ability to actually do it. The second is that programs have to offer choice. So as well as new forms of assessment, we have to address the time issue. And we've done that at Pearson with our remotely proctored service called On View, where candidates can do their tests, their exams at home. But the key here is that students want to learn and test when and where they want as part of an omni-channel offering. And the third piece is that they could be customized. We have to build learning and testing that matches one person and individual's career needs. And with technologies pervading the workplace, professionals then have to keep reskilling for their next job role or next project. Assessments will match this. So it's likely that two individuals learning programs are made up of completely separate components. They'll be modular in size and scope, allowing an individual to build credentials based on their unique job roles and aspirations. Made up of more nimble digital micro credentials and badges, nano degrees, 
that demonstrate skills and competency, essentially unbundling qualifications into shorter credentials that stack into a curriculum that suits an individual. And that fits in with lifelong learning and it counters the shrinking shelf life of skills. But it also better connects education with the workplace. It's valued by employers and their HR departments. And it gives organizations what they're looking for in terms of skills. Now, updating skills and the need for people to own their own skills portfolio is no small issue. This is now making headline news. And this appeared on Sky News just last week that 90% of people will need new skills by 20. 30. And we each have to be responsible for owning and updating these. And in my last slide, in a great report from Forrester called The Future of Organizations, they called out that in today's customer led and disruption rich market, many organizations are proving to be slow and rigid and culturally tone deaf. And I love that that silos, long decision cycles and disjointed customer experiences stymie change and they frustrate customers. So we need to have our radar on. We need to be customer led and very quick to market. And one opportunity for learning that stands out here is that companies and their employees will look for currency and relevancy and proof of those skills. That will lead to more demand for ongoing, continuous, lifelong learning and certification. And it gives education the chance to build better ties with industry, with vocational offerings. And micro learning will be all the rage as people learn in bite-sized pieces. They learn, apply, learn, apply it to their work and can stay right up to date in their field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. That was really interesting. And I think there's lots of key takeaways there um, in such a condensed space of time. So we've all learned from that short piece um, that you've given. I've got a, a question in from the audience, if I may ask you. Um, uh, what they've asked is that yesterday we heard a lot about hybrid learning, where there was a balance between um, working from home and also from classroom learning. So learning on the job and learning in the classroom environment and that there needs to be a balance following the pandemic and, and how we deliver some of that because people still engage and like to engage with people directly. Um, do you think that classroom learning still does have a role to play in future? Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I, I think it does actually. Um but maybe in a slightly adjusted model. Um, I think lots of learners still like the classroom environment for two reasons. One is to interact with their instructor and ask specific questions of them in a face-to-face -face setting. And the second, which is the best human trait of all, is the, the, the networking with other people, with other learners that are sitting on, on, alongside you. So I think it will be a combination of both. Um, you know, we, we read a lot these days about the flipped classroom where people learn on their own and they do that all study takes place individually maybe at home but then you get together into a class to, to discuss and debate and share ideas so the classroom may have a slightly adjusted role in future but I, I don't see classroom learning disappearing at all anytime soon thank you thank you Matthew and um, micro learning, when do you think that will tip the balance? That was the, the other question. So when do you think that you'll see more of that taking taking the percentage away from the sort of classroom in that balance? How long do you think we're away from that? I mean, I think initially micro micro learning is growing at such a rate, Joe. Um, we, you know, one organization I know that I've partnered with in the past issued something like 10 million badges for micro learning in, in two or three years. So it's sort of coming up behind us very quietly without necessarily getting the publicity that it, it deserves. But I think initially micro learning will simply complement how people learn and, and certify today. But I think within 
five or five or ten years, it will easily be the predominant way of learning in in very small bite-sized pieces um, that, that people can can digest a bit of learning information and then apply it to what they're doing in the workplace. So, you know, it could be 20, 25 minutes at a time. Um, I think the key piece that needs to be figured out first is how do you assemble smaller bite-sized pieces into an overall qualification? Um, and again, like I talked about individual curriculum, how do you assess that two people are, are doing very different learning components but ultimately reaching the same qualification. That needs to be clearly defined before this can gain traction.